What is up? Welcome to another edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Podcast. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, socially distancing from the world. All right, let's just let's just get this housekeeping out of the way, right? Uh, as of our last show, we took last week off, and uh, for those of you who listened to the most recent show, you know that uh, well, change is happening again. We went through this a couple of years ago, uh, where we kind of went through a transition in the pod, and we are doing that again. Uh, Michael Fabiano, no longer with the podcast. We wish him well. I know he's doing big things over at SiriusXM, uh, so you can check him out there. But that means we are sort of in transition. Um, and it seems like a good time to do that because we are approaching what should be the start of training camps. Uh, we're planning to do a whole lot of different things around training camps. We're, we're hoping, you know, knock on wood, fingers crossed, to have some interviews to get some players, that sort of thing. But in the meantime, I felt like it would be a good time, a fun thing to go through and have what I'm calling uh, fantasy camp, where we go through by division, each of the eight divisions. Uh, we'll be doing two shows a week, so you can do the math. That's four weeks. And uh, bring in some some names maybe you know if you're deep in these fantasy streets, maybe, names maybe you don't know, and hopefully we can introduce you to those. But uh, we'll kind of have a couple of guests each and every week, each and every show, to talk some of the divisions uh, and generally just, just have some fun. So uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But before we do that, i got to go and talk to my faithful producer, Senior Edward L. Murphy Esquire. Murph, how did you enjoy your time away from here? Yeah, I went back uh, east and uh, was living at home in New York City for two weeks, but still working. And then uh, we took a week off here. I know you needed a much uh, need a break, um, but I am glad to be back twice a week. Uh, gives us something to do, you know, uh, you know, and we're, we're learning as we go. And uh, it occupies our time somehow because now we are back in lockdown. Um, I am actually going back on vacation next week. So it is a weird jumble time for us. <laughs> but um I don't know, man. We got we to find whatever gives us peace during this time and just a little bit of happiness. No doubt. No doubt about it. So uh, so this week for this show, I wanted to start with a couple of guys that uh, I, I know well, that you probably know well. Again, if you are deep in the fantasy streets or even if you've listened to this show, you have seen these names, you have heard these voices uh, as part of the show before. So I felt like this was a great way to kick it off. Uh, bringing in from The Athletic, Jake Seeley, who is a friend, not only a friend of the program, just a friend. I don't say friend of the program. He's just a friend as well. You can find him on Twitter at All In Kid. Uh, and our pal, researcher extraordinaire and all around nice guy, Michael F. Florio. I wanted to differentiate that from the other <laughs> Mike Florio. Uh, fellas, appreciate you jumping in with, the, with me today. Uh, how, how are things in your respective corners of the world? I'm good. And this is what I like is that as long as I've known Florio for his, basically most of his career, everybody always says genuine nice guy. So you just know he's like the <laughs> nicest guy in the industry. That's the first thing anybody says about him. I try. I, I, people could say worse, I guess. So being nice right. is not a bad thing. Right. You have cool. the opposite spectrum, Florio. Like I'm the, I'm the one everybody hates in the jerk on Twitter. And you're the super nice guy. <laughs> you're the heel, though. I feel you like it's a, yeah, it's a, you, you embrace the hate. Yeah. Yeah, you are kind of the the, the fantasy uh, Twitter heel. So uh, we all, we all got to be something, right? We all got to fill a role. So there it is. Um, so I I do want to talk with you about you with you guys. I can speak English. I want to talk with you guys about the AFC East. But before we dive into that, I kind of want to go off menu a little bit because Jake, you wrote something on the Athletic that came out on Monday. Uh, first off, you and I are proud members of the uh, I hate PPR club. Um, and you wrote uh, an article basically saying that, you know, all these people who have gone to these tight end premium leagues, basically like stop that. And you went through a long explanation that folks should go to the athletic and check it out uh, about why tight end premium maybe isn't this you know great new thing that people are making it out to be. Could you just sort of top line why, why you are against tight end premium? Yeah, the exact title was I'm sick of tight end premium scoring <laughs> and here's why. Uh, really, the, the, the most simplest version of it is that it doesn't boost the position like people think it might. It just really overvalues tier one and tier two of tight ends and just makes that even more prominent. And it's actually, it even separates tier one from tier two by a wider gap. That's the biggest point about it is that the tight end one, two, and three every single year just gets a bigger gap from that next tier. So you're not really helping the position. You're just making those top two or three guys more valuable than they should be across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a fair point. I know that everybody is, look, we're all wishing and hoping to get tight ends back in our lives, right? Like 
basically, and you broke it down. It's, it's you have one of two choices. You go early, you get the the Kelseys and Kittles and Ertzes of the world, or you wait late and you're banking on you know Mike Gasicki to turn into something. Like last year, it was Mark Andrews that that was the big thing. Um, so we're all sort of wishing for it, but basically, I think you're saying we're trying to we have to find a new algorithm. We have to find a new way to make tight end more valuable right now. Yeah, I think the easiest answer to so so for a lot of my home leagues, I boost the scoring for yardage to offset. Mm -hmm. Like, it, I mean, one per ten sounds nice and clean, but mm -hmm. we're at the point everything's automated anyway. But <laughs> if you really want to make tight end more valuable, add a flex that's only wide receiver slash tight end. Like, mm -hmm. don't include running backs. Yeah. And I say slash wide receiver just so like the six week or sixteen bye weeks, you're not absolutely killed at tight end and down <laughs> to like the twenty fives of the world and Caden Smith. Right, right. That's fair. No, that's absolutely fair. No, I just I came across the article, felt like I'm getting Jake on the show. I, I had to ask you about it. So appreciate it. Uh, so I want to jump into the AFC East, and I, I've got some questions for each of the four teams. Uh, and then we'll just sort of kind of you know kind of talk about best and worst in the division and what have you. Um, and so I want to start with the Buffalo Bills. And so Floria, let me start with you because you are sort of our resident Bills fan here. Um they bring in what they bring in extra weapons. They go get Stefan Diggs, right? Like this is a big deal for them. It seems great. He's got John Brown who had a pretty good year last year. Uh, how confident are we in Josh Allen? We know he can run, but, but we need him to throw the ball effectively and accurately as well. Do we have a level of confidence? He'll be better at that this year. Josh Allen is the bill that I'm most confident in and most willing to draft this year. Um, I, I do think he has that safe floor with his legs. I think that he, he's still going to continue to run. And I think Stefan Diggs coming to Buffalo is going to help Josh Allen more than I think it will help Stefan Diggs. I think that Diggs' targets are still going to be around what they were with Minnesota. I think the Bills are still going to be a team that wants to rely on their defense and running the ball. But Diggs is an, an extremely dangerous weapon, especially in that like 10 to 20 air yard distance. And that is where Josh Allen really took a step forward this year, last year. And I think that that is where Diggs and his ability to do damage after the catch will only help Josh Allen. But it's one of those scenarios where they have a lot of different weapons that I don't really want to deal with all of those weapons week to week, but I just want to deal with the guy that's throwing those weapons, the ball and going to rack up the fantasy points. You know, I, yeah. I have, go ahead, Jake. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I don't know if you saw my reaction. I'm I'm not as <laughs> confident. I do like what they're doing. So uh, for, for comparison, like I keep saying that Josh Allen's basically Cam Newton. And yes. the what we saw with Cam Newton in Carolina is they tried the big man receiver approach of Kelvin Benjamin, Devin Funch, just thinking, oh, he's not accurate. Well, let's get giant dudes to just catch the ball. And it didn't help him because there's still 50-50 balls. You're just throwing it to a big guy versus a small guy. And towards the end of his career – he started to get better in that very last year, especially with DJ Moore before he got hurt last season. He started he, dramatic increase in the reception percentage and the uh, completion percentage because they got guys who can get open quickly. And they're doing that with Josh Allen. I love the digs approach. My problem with Josh Allen for fantasy is nine rushing touchdowns. Cam Newton, very similar, but Cam Newton only got that close, what, one and a half times, like he eclipsed it one time and got closed another time. If Josh Allen is just, 500 yards and five rushing touchdowns, which is a very realistic number, and doesn't improve to at least 3,500 passing yards, which is 500 more than he had last year. And he only had 22 touchdowns. My biggest concern is if he has a significant drop off with the legs in the rushing touchdown department, is he going to make enough up in the passing games? That's why I'm a little tentative at QB7. I'd still prefer if he had last year's draft costs around QB10 or 11. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously we we have become uh, enamored with quarterbacks who can run with the football. And the fact that, you know, look, going through this Scott Fishbowl draft in my division, uh, look, I, I took Josh Allen in the third round and I posted it and people like looked at me sideways. And I'm like, well, look, you know, he was at that point, seven quarterbacks were gone by the time I drafted Josh Allen. And it's like, I'm not 100 percent in love with it, but I had to get myself a quarterback I could at least feel decent about. And that's sort of the going rate. Um Jake, you mentioned Stefan Diggs, and you like the approach that the Bills are putting together there. Uh, you know, John Brown had a good year last year. Is Stefan Diggs really six rounds approximately of ADP better than John Brown? I feel like they're a little bit closer together. At least they should be a little bit closer together in my mind. I'm in full agreement with you. I have Stefan Diggs as a wide receiver three, and I have John Brown as like wide receiver four or five territory, depending on how deep your league is. But I think they're closer, a, a big part, because I think John Brown's going to destroy 
the second level cornerbacks. I, I think mm -hmm. if you look at John Brown, his ability to handle number ones, and then have seen his career, what he does to number two cornerbacks, and then you have the attention of Diggs. I think that you're just looking at the fact that they could post very similar numbers with John Brown, more yards per reception and touchdowns, Stefan Diggs, more receptions and value that way. But it shouldn't be a six round gap. I still would take Diggs 10 times out of 10 over John Brown, but I don't think the gap should be that large. Uh, is there a third reliable target for either of you guys there in, in Buffalo? Is it just kind of those two guys? If for you take out reliable. For fantasy. Yeah, for <laughs> For fantasy, fantasy you no, know, yes. but in real life, I think Cole Beasley is going to be more involved than they than than a lot of people like to think. Uh, like last year, Cole Beasley was Josh Allen's safety blanket, and I know John Brown put up all the big numbers, and he was the asset that we all wanted for fantasy. But it, you know, on those third and shorts or any time that Josh Allen was feeling pressure, he's going Cole Beasley's way immediately. Right, right. Uh, Florio, why won't the Bills let Devin Singletary be great? Like I want no part of Devin Singletary for fantasy. Um, <laughs> I, I think because for their approach, the way that they're going to use him is better for real life. Like I think they are going to continue to limit him near the goal line. I think we will see Zach Moss, who is a significantly bigger running back, be used in that role. I think Josh Allen will still get his near the goal line. Uh, even if it's only five touchdowns, it's still a large chunk that is not going to Devin Singletary. Uh, and then we've heard Brendan Bean, the Bills GM, talk up Zach Moss saying, we didn't think he was going to be there in round three. This is a guy that we think can come in and compete for early down work with Devin Singletary. They were used, they both were taken in the third round, similar draft capital. So to me, it's just one of those scenarios where I could, I think Singletary will lead this backfield, but I wouldn't be surprised if Moss has a larger role than we are expecting. And because Moss is going so many rounds later, it's like four rounds or something like that at this point. I'd much rather get that discount on a Zach Moss. You touching Moss agree. at all? You touching Moss yeah. at all, Jay? Uh, see, I, I didn't have interest at Moss with the hype before the draft, and I actually thought he was getting way overrated. Just uh, I could be wrong. I'm not 100% right on all my <laughs> draft prospects, <laughs> but I didn't see what most people saw, the fans of Zach Moss. That being said, I think Singletary is very similar to what he was last year. He was never going to be the goal line option. He was never going to be a high-volume touchdown guy. You wanted him for the yards, and that's fine. And Devin Singletary can fit this role and still be a low-end RB2 just again and just be great, but he's going right there. Zach Moss is going in the low 40s, mid 40s at best that you see some places. And we're talking about taking the Frank Gore role. He can do better than Frank Gore at this point in Frank Gore's career. As much as I'm not even a Zach Moss fan, I still think he's better than that. So I would surprisingly take Zach Moss at that price now. My frustration with Devin Singletary is that it seemed like he needed three forms of ID to score a touchdown. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't understand why. I mean, he went long stretches. He had one touchdown like in the back half of the season, and that was on a trick play, right? It was, it was that Thanksgiving Day. He caught a pass from John Brown, and I'm like, this is what we have to do to get him in the end zone. I, I can't live like this. I just, I just can't live that way. There was one sequence. I think it was three times in a row from the one Frank Gore got stuffed, and then on fourth down, Josh Allen ran it in. It was like <laughs> there's nothing Devin Singletary can do there to, to better his case to get on the field, and they still were just like, no, we're going to let the quarterback run it. <laughs> Man. Um, let's take our talents down to South Beach, shall we? Uh, the Dolphins, you know, they were surprising last year. Like nobody – people had them – I mean, if you listen to the hype, you thought they were going to win negative games last year, and they ended up winning five, right? So – and on top of it, they still get their guy in Tua Tagovailoa. So I'll start with you, Jake. Does Tua start a game this year? And if so, about when do you think that happens? Yeah, yes, at the end of the season. I keep saying on the podcast, I'd, I'd say two and a half games. This is the over-under I would put. If I was a Vegas odds guy, I actually think it's going to be similar to Patrick Mahomes, but for a different reason. And the fact that they know he's not healthy because some people push back immediately and say, well, what if they start off one and five or whatever? Like, what? look. I actually just don't think that it's smart of them. I think they went into this knowing that they fell into Tua. Fortunately, it was tank for Tua, and they still were able to get him without getting the first pick. But this is their future. It, it, like, Make sure he's 100%. You've actually got that built in where the fan base has to understand it isn't going to push back as much that you would normally get when you take a pick this high and say, oh, we're one and four. We got to put the rookie in. They're going to understand this is the future. The Dolphins fan base has been understanding of this for a while. So you have that built in injury where they don't have to put him out there and feel that pressure. So I think the end of the season, once you start saying, all right, he's had some time to learn. He had that learning curve built in already that we understood was going to have to happen. So all this works together. I, I, again, I would put it at two and a half games the end of the season. Uh, I mean, obviously he's a dynasty guy right now. I mean, that, that's where his greater value is, Florio. I mean, is have you have you taken any shots at Tua anywhere? I, I, what is your outlook on him this season? 
Yeah, I kind of agree with Jake. Like, I don't think he's going to play until like the late in the season, maybe more than two games, but not by much, I don't think. So I, I'm really not drafting him anywhere. I have taken Ryan Fitzpatrick in best balls because we've seen it in years past. Like, yeah, Fitz, he'll have that game where he throws like three interceptions, but he'll also have those games where they're trailing and he's just heaving the ball downfield and he's going to put up, you know, 30 plus fantasy points. So in a best ball format, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is awesome. And I think Ryan Fitzpatrick, and the fact that he's like fun and fans can rally behind him will lead to there being even less of like fans rallying for Tua to get into games. So I, I do agree with all of what Jake said there. Yeah. A um, little later in the show, I want to do some either ors, uh, you know, with some players in the AFC East and beyond. But I'm going to just put this out to you guys right now, both of you. Who'd you rather, Jordan Howard or Matt Breida? Howard. And Breida. Like, <laughs> ooh, here's the thing. I'm not even a Howard fan. Like I've I've railed against this guy as a talent for his entire career. So, and it's not that I don't like Jordan Howard. It's just you can find eighteen to fifteen thousand running backs who can do what he can do. And the problem is, is like, well, that's downside for his ability. It's fine for fantasy. It's fine for real life because he's going to do what he's given. And they went out there and tried to improve this offensive line. They're going to run more this year after Fitzpatrick leading this team last year in rushing. But he's the lead guy now. Could he falter and Breida gets the job? That's why I still like taking Breida as well. But if you're talking about who the lead option is, as much as you can hate on Jordan Howard, he's going to do what he's asked to do and do it fine like he has every single year. Okay, so to make your case for Breida now, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I'll, I'll start it too by saying, like, I like Jordan Howard in round, round nine. I think it's a fine value. But at that point in the draft, I'm chasing upside. And I think Matt Breida's ceiling is high. Like, Jordan Howard's floor is much safer but I think Breida and that explosiveness that he possesses, I think he will be the primary pass catching back for the Dolphins. I also think that like his explosiveness, last each of the last two years, there's never been a ball carrier that ran faster than Matt Breida. Like he's paced all ball carriers in 2019 and 2018. So I think that shows us that when he is healthy, and I know it's been, I mean, he's been like a human body bag for most of his career, <laughs> but when he is healthy and, and he gets to that that burst, I think he can take it the distance at any point. So I do like both Dolphins backs. I think because of how bad they performed last year as, as a team, not even these two individuals, that people are devaluing them and they're going in like round nine. And I have no problem taking a shot on both. I just think Breida's upside is a little bit higher. I mean, I'll tell you, I've been getting a lot of Jordan Howard in a lot of different places. Partially, so the way I've approached a lot of drafts recently, I try to get at least one – top level running back early in the first couple of rounds. And then I seem to go wide receiver heavy in the middle. So then I'm sitting there around round eight or round nine. I'm like, okay, I'd probably need to get another running back. And Jordan Howard just keeps falling <laughs> in my lap. And I feel like, I feel like his only crime against us is having skillets for hands, right? Like that's it. <laughs> that's the only thing he's actually done. Last year, he was a solid RB two in Philadelphia until he got hurt. And I just don't see, look, and you mentioned it, Florio, the, the running back situation was bad, right? We got to the point that we're, we were banking on Patrick Laird at the end of the year <laughs> last year in Miami, right? Like that's how bad it was because Kalen Balaj was like running in quicksand all season. So uh, I do think it's going to be better. I don't know. That's that's my thing. I like Jordan Howard. I think I think you know was it Mike Clay? I think a couple years ago who just completely destroyed Jordan Howard's fantasy world. And then, like, no, was that was the that was uh, the one oh the one that couldn't break a tackle to save his life. That was there before him. I could that could be anybody. Uh, I know <laughs> it was the running back right before Jordan Howard. I can't remember right now in Chicago. Yeah. We're all brain know. farting over here. Yeah. Mike Davis came to mind, but that's not it. <laughs> no, I'm going to have to do a Google search while we're doing this. Cause I, I remember what you're talking about because I complained about him and then he went scorched earth on him and he became the guy who hated him. Right. So, um, Jake, what did, did people forget about Preston Williams? And I, I asked this in regards to one, Williams ADP, which is double digit rounds, but also in regards to what it means for Devontae Parker, because I don't, the Devontae Parker breakout doesn't happen the same way. I think if Preston Williams stays healthy all year long, and it just seems like people kind of forgot about that. So first it's Jeremy Langford. That's ah, it there it is. That's it. Uh, and so second of all, I think it's, it's funny. It's a lot of people have forgotten about Preston Williams, but the people who remember seem to think like he put up top 10 <laughs> receiving numbers while he's out. Like, it's funny that like, the people who remember think he's God at fantasy mm -hmm. football. And so I think it's, you got to look at both like Preston Williams. I'll go back to something I said when he came out of college, that if it wasn't for the off the field and not playing an entire last year in college, 
I had my person like my personal grade is a third round grade. Like I thought he was a day two pick. His talent would have been there. He would have definitely been drafted. He would have been one of the most talked about wide receivers. But because of the off field stuff, everything you saw what happened to him, that talent is still there. And we saw that talent show itself last year. I think people need to remember that and remember the talent that's still behind them. Uh, there has been plenty of players that have had off the field issues and never come back around. But I do like him a lot, especially if we're continuing to talk about a team like the Dolphins, whose defense is starting to approve, but still a problem with Fitzpatrick at quarterback. I think he definitely needs to be as a late round pick and is probably going to get to the point in mid-August where he's a mid-round pick. Yeah, I mean, I think so, too. I, and I guess maybe I, I tend to fall into that category of people who think who remember him better than he actually was. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think he was top 10, but I'm like, I feel like he was better than he was. And then I go back and look and I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. He's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. I mean, look, I guess because he was a rookie and he didn't, you know, we didn't really give him a whole lot of expectations and he was playing in a on a supposedly bad offense. Maybe it was, uh, maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Um, up to New England. Obviously, they went through a little bit of change. I don't know if you heard, but the, this guy named Brady left and uh, went somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> sixth round pick with Michigan, you know, I don't know. Um so Cam Newton is there. That was obviously the big story from a couple of weeks ago. And then this, this chatter began that Cam might not be the starter. You know, like they still like Jared Stidham. They want to give him a chance. And this is, uh, Florio, are you buying this Cam might not be the starter business? Not even a little bit. Even <laughs> when Stidham was like the guy, I kept thinking like, no, like Bill Belichick is not going to go into a year with – Jared Stidham and Brian Hoyer as his quarterbacks, knowing what's out there. And then it just made sense. I think they waited until, you know, the the punishment for uh, videotaping practices came out because it was the oh. same day. It was like a, like, like 10 minutes later. Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, all right, yeah, we're signing Cam Newton, by the way. But <laughs> I think they've had that planned. And uh, I think Cam is the starter. I think Cam's ceiling is so much higher. Like what he brings to that team, especially a team with that good of a defense, like – it's just built for a, a quarterback like Cam Newton to come in and not an unproven guy like Jared Stidham, who I understand there's people out there who love Jared Stidham, but he was a fourth round pick and did put up very pedestrian numbers in college. Cam Newton's a former NFL MVP who's been in the Super Bowl recently. Like, come on, it's it's Cam's job. <laughs> No question about it. I did a victory lap when this happened, Marcus, because <laughs> I called this to a T. I was like, he's still going to the Patriots because this is why, from a real life perspective, this is the per perfect situation for the Patriots. If Cam comes in and sucks, you tank without looking like you tanked. Like you still <laughs> tried. You brought in Cam Newton. So it's like, oh, well, we did our best. Oh, well, we now we go get the number one pick. Uh, which, you know, again, like, could you imagine if that somehow happened? And I don't know if it will, but like Bill Belichick is able to get Trevor Lawrence next year like that's just not fair it's not right it's not right that would be my luck as a bills fan though it would be your luck this it is absolutely. the first year i think of my life where they have a chance of winning the division <laughs> you guys are still gonna throw each other through tables anyway so who cares oh, <laughs> i have never once been thrown through a table though you know what if i could you know you see those tweets about what would you say to like you know 15 year old you or whatever like i would say buy the market on plastic folding tables in the buffalo area <laughs> That's what it I would tell my. It was a story in when the Bills had to play in Houston in the playoffs. Like stores were sold out of folding tables in Houston. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't understand. But okay, you do you, um, Jake. How much? How much is Julian Edelman hurt by not having Tom Brady this year? I actually don't think he's very hurt at all. I think this is possibly a break-even situation. I think there would have been a downgrade with Stidham. But I, I go back to what we were talking about earlier in the show when I was mentioning the fact of what the Panthers did towards late in his career, and especially with DJ Moore. Cam Newton's or completion percentage jumped off that charts last year, and it wasn't all that worse than what Tom Brady was. And I think you look at Edelman, it's a compound of now you have Cam Newton who should be honing in on him. But what's his competition on top of it? It's, it's pretty much the same issues we had last year. Nikhil Harry ended up being a bust as a rookie. I still don't think his career is a bust yet. Let's right. give him more than one year to call that. But, you know, a transition quarterback and Jacoby Myers, Gunner, just go down the list of all these random Muhammad Sanu, who knows what he has left. And he's already practicing with Cam Newton, but it's just no tight ends. There's just so much that I still think that if Julian Edelman plays a full season, Season, which is that's the only question we have with Julian Edelman. He should still be in line for his eight, nine, possibly ten targets a week. Yeah, uh, I mean Julian Edelman. I mean, look, as as a non PPR guy, like Julian Edelman is sort of the poster child for all that frustrates me about it. Like a dude who's gonna thirteen be for eighty one. 
<laughs> man, I mean, like a dude who gets like 100 catches and has like 900 yards. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, you mentioned the kill Harry, so I'm going to throw out another who'd you rather to you guys. Uh, who'd you rather if you're looking at Patriots, Nikhil Harry or Sony Michelle? Nikhil Harry. First. Easily. Like, Sony Michelle. What is the appeal of Sony Michelle? <laughs> like, this guy, I, I mean, all of his career touchdowns, I think, legitimately outside of three, have come within the five yard line. And now he has Cam Newton there who is going to steal some of those. There's, there's Harris, there's White, there's Burkhead. He has no explosiveness. I'm sorry. The guy that he was in Georgia is just gone. Now he is it, – it's like Todd Gurley. Like, he is the much less successful version of Todd Gurley. He, his <laughs> knee went out well before he had any success in the NFL. Uh, I just – I want th – the Patriots are probably the team that I'm targeting the least of their players on because I just – they I don't see the upside in many of these guys. I like Julian Edelman on his cost, but same thing. I would take the kill Harry 10 times out of 10. This is one that we go back to. Again, there's a reason he was drafted where he was drafted and the thought around him. He could be a bust. It, like we, we, He wouldn't be the first wide receiver bust ever, especially on the Patriots, surprisingly. Right. But the fact is, is you, you, I agree with Florio 100%. I don't see the upside of Michelle where a lot of people are forgetting that the concern after drafting Damian Harris last year was that he was going to push for Sony Michelle's touches, but he can actually be used in the passing game, unlike Michelle. So... I think the Harris return from injury is even overshadowed a little bit to the point of Sonny Michelle, what you said, Florida, his knee might be as bad as Todd Gurley's already. <laughs> right. Except, you know, again, Todd Gurley at least catches passes. Like he has the ability to catch the ball too. Like, you know, I, I know people are worried about Gurley, but uh, there's way more upside there than <laughs> there is with Sonny Michelle. Um, all right. The Jetropolitans. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't even know how to. So, you know, you remember when you're like a teenager and you learn about the, that fortune cookie game where you add the words in bed to every fortune and then like you read them and you giggle because you're stupid. You're a kid. <laughs> like I feel like when we talk about the Jets, everything we say about the Jets fantasy wise is always uh, you know, finished by but Adam Gaze. So let's just get the, the but Adam Gaze part out of the way and just say, you know, I just, how much better would you guys feel about the Jets offense? with literally any other head – it doesn't have to be an offensive genius, right? Like, I'm not asking for Andy Reid or Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan to come scheme anything, but literally anybody but Adam Gase, would you guys feel better about the pieces in this Jets offense? I was legitimately going through the coaching staffs of the NFL. I was like, I really don't know if I could pick a word. The only thing I could go back to is like bringing back Kelvin, Kevin Gilbride from the Giants from years back. <laughs> that might be the only thing that's worse because then you just know it's run past – and then what draw on third down when it's third and seven. <laughs> yeah. Unless Gase gets to bring the ghost of paint Manning back with him. I want no part of him. Uh, all right. So then knowing, okay, now that we've gotten that part out of the way, uh, Florio, how early, what's the earliest you'd reach for Lev Bell? I am really on the, I'm off of Lev Bell. Like last year, Lev Bell did not finish as a top five running back at all. Uh, last year, he did not have a run of 20 yards. Despite, you know, getting all of the Jets running back touches there, uh, I think there's more competition for his work now this year than last year. Last year behind him was Ty Montgomery. This year now they brought in Frank Gore, and I know Gore is ancient, but Gore still everywhere he goes gets well over 100 carries. And two years ago, Adam Gase used Frank Gore over Kenyon Drake. So the fact that Frank Gore may be a larger part of this offense than I think we're realizing, I I'm not going to overlook that. Then there's a uh, – the, the LaMichael Perrin, who they drafted, who uh, Piran, who I think could also eat into Le'Veon Bell's some carries a little bit more than Montgomery did. And plus, Le'Veon Bell is 28 years old now, which is the age where running back efficiency starts to decline. Uh, last year, he did not really show any explosiveness, and he's going to once again be playing for Adam Gase and a head coach who doesn't really want him and makes that very publicly known. Uh, so I just, to me, Le'Veon Bell is more of a safe low end RB two that you're going to take because of that volume that he's going to have. But the days of the upside and the days of the, seeing Le'Veon Bell, the RB one, which some people I think still think Bell has in him. I don't. So I, I'm just really out on Le'Veon Bell. Haven't you seen he's taking this offseason seriously in the best shape of his life, Florio? <laughs> have you seen that? <laughs> SOHL? I haven't seen that. No. Yeah. yeah it's, look, this is, I will say this. Uh, I I actually am on the opposite side, Florio. I'm taking, but only because of the cost. Uh, you you you're not wrong in anything you said. On the flip side, the good news is that he was an RB two almost every single week. Like the ceiling yeah. was never there, but he never <laughs> truly let you down. I think his worst score was like seven or eight points. So there was a like a down week or two, but he was remarkably consistent despite how bad the Jets were. Another team that's tried to adjust the offensive line. 
I don't disagree with you. The biggest issue I have is that I don't think Frank Gore is an issue. I don't think Piran's an issue. I think Gase is the issue. And that <laughs> if if it was any other head coach, as you said at the top, Marcus, is if it was any other head coach, I would actually be considering Le'Veon Bell with the upside to be an RB1 again. But I just don't know if that he just doesn't hate the guy because he wasn't as sold on the contract. And then Piran gets involved and Gore gets involved. But I'm okay with Bell because at cost, he's going about, what, fourth round this year? And that to me... How many guys are in line for his touches as long as he gets the usage from last year? Yeah, you know, I think the thing with about one, he had maybe the quietest 300 touches in the history of ever. Right. Uh, last year. Like I went and looked and I'm like, he actually touched the ball 300 times last year. That was amazing. I couldn't believe that. Um, and again, if I have him as my RB2, I feel okay about it. I, you know, but I want, and I, I've heard the rumor that if things go bad for the Jets this year, which is certainly possible, that they may look to trade him. And so now I just I'm sort of rooting for that to happen because I just want him back in our lives. I think the, the talent is there. He just needs the opportunity, and he's just not going to get it uh, in in New York. Um, so Jake, now I'm, I'm I may be asking this question with my heart, uh, <laughs> but Sam Darnold. Um, now, like I'm I'm not going to be crazy about it. We're talking like super flex leagues, two QB leagues, that sort of thing. How do we feel about him this year? Same I've always felt. I'm just, I'm not a Darnold guy. You're asking the wrong guy here. It's just like Sam Darnold. I, I, I'm pretty sure when he came out of college, I said he has Andy Dalton as a ceiling, which in fantasy wouldn't be that bad. Andy Dalton finishes a QB one multiple, two or three. That. <laughs> yeah, but that's a ceiling. And that's my problem with Sam Darnold. I just, I think that part of it is the team construction and that's not his fault. Uh, unfortunately for him, he is where he is under the coach that we're talking about. But I just think Sam Darnold's own limitations and some of his decision making is still stuff that we saw in college when we were complaining in college that he hadn't made the progression and starting to read defenses better. It didn't take a step forward into the NFL and it's still there. I, I'm not even making the jokes about seeing ghosts. I'm just talking about his play style. He just hasn't made the reads and I think that's holding him back. I'll tell you this. Uh, I'm one as a as an SC fan and alum. I, I go back to I go back to that Rose Bowl game when they played Penn State, and that was honestly the highs and lows of Sam Darnold. Because in the first half, he looked miserable. He looked awful. Uh, you know, Saquon Barkley was kind of announcing himself to the world. Chris Godwin was making plays, and then second half, fourth quarter, especially the Trojans trailing, Darnold turns it on. He becomes all world, and you're like, now I understand why this guy potentially is a a number one overall pick. Uh, it just, I, I know Florio just seems like the range. Maybe is that what it is? Just the range is too great with, with Darnold right now. I, I think that, and I think also for fantasy, it's the fact that he doesn't add a whole bunch with his legs. So that there, there are a lot of quarterbacks too, that go in that range, uh, like as low as QB twos that I just like more because of what they can do with their legs. Darnold though, I did get in Scott Fishbowl as my QB three. He's one of these weird players though. Like I, I agree with you guys. Like, I'm not fully sold on him, but there are people out there who believe that Sam Darnold still is, like, the next breakout quarterback. And, like, they, 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 there's so many Sam Darnold truthers that uh, his ADP is always a little bit higher because there's always people who still believe that he's going to have one of those big breakout years. Well, and I know that, you know, uh, Manish Mehta, who I know listens to the pod on occasion, um, you know, and obviously is the beat writer, covers the Jets or whatever, he loves Sam Darnold. And, like, I... I want to have that same level of faith, that same level of belief. And I just feel like the situation maybe is not, is not going to allow for it. Um, I'll take also, a bite out of this hat. If it happens just for uh, you, Marcus. <laughs> Hot hey, you know what? They're not going to play this year. It looks like I know. Not gonna, not gonna play <laughs> this year. is Notre Dame going to have like three games this year. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, I will say that as an SC fan, the, the conference only schedule, uh, sort of saves us the embarrassment of getting stomped out by Alabama to start the year. So uh, <laughs> if there's a silver lining, that's that's what that is. Um, let's look at some superlatives from the AFC East. I'm going to go through and kind of get you some categories and, and want to get names from both of you guys. So first off, who will be the best AFC East fantasy quarterback this year? That's an easy one for me. I think it's Josh Allen. It is uh, I, like as much <laughs> as I just complained about his ADP before. It's still it's still Josh Allen, and I'm a big fan of Cam Newton. Cam is is the uh, the one that will give him comp. I don't think the other guys will. Okay, um, tight end. I mean, obviously, I know that everybody sort of loves Mike Gesicki. I love Mike Gesicki. He's kind of a late round sleeper. There is is he the best fantasy tight end in the, in the division, or is there somebody that I'm forgetting right now? Chris Herndon. Everybody forgot about Chris Herndon was top 10 ADP last year because they're all oh, matchup problem. So everybody just doesn't want nothing or anything to do with him this year. If healthy, I, can you? 
see a world where he's the second best receiver on the Jets? I see one. I mean, yeah, but I, I feel like that says more about the Jets receivers necessarily <laughs> than it does about Chris Herndon. Hey, they got Brashard Perriman. <laughs> yeah, Brashard Perriman. They got Denzel Mims. <sighs> And then another year of like another year of Jameson Crowder. Yeah, so who's there you just go. Like, just run go routes. They don't break open. So Chris Herndon and Jameson Crowder are open underneath for Sam Darnold's 15 yard pass. Oh, uh, man. Uh, okay. Uh, biggest <laughs> sleepers in the AFC East. If you guys have any sleepers in this division, uh, I would say Nikhil Harry. I think because Preston Williams does go a few rounds earlier than him. Harry, like Jake said, first round pick last year. I think uh, him being that outside downfield receiver that the Patriots lacked last year. I mean, the last year they just had slot receivers running 10 yard routes, but now like he could be that field stretcher for them. Uh, I think he is just the prototypical receiver that can play well with the Cam Newton. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned two of them already, Marcus. I would go with Zach Moss and Preston Williams. I think both of what we talked about from earlier and what their cost is right now, uh, throwing Harry there too. But I will say, if not Harry and Julian Edelman at this point of his career, I know he's going to be 31 by the time the season starts, which isn't the end of the world. But Mohamed Sanu, I don't know if you saw that picture when he was working out with Cam Newton, but I didn't realize Mohamed Sanu was that freaking ripped. Right? Me neither. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I he's saw that. hiding that well. <laughs> Man. I always thought of him as like a skinny guy, like skinny slot receiver, and he's out here just jacked. <sighs> okay, so then on the flip side, who are the guys in the AFC East you feel like are being the most overdrafted right now? Ooh, uh, you know what? I, I, it's funny. I mean, you anybody? I mean, like honestly, it might not be anybody because like I feel like the, the the division as a whole is sort of depressed fantasy wise. I, it really is. I think that if you go back to Josh Allen again, like it's it's not that he's QB seven; it's that where QB seven is coming off the board, and I think that's the problem with it. So I think everybody else is pretty reasonable. You know what? I wouldn't even mention. I'll throw one more sleeper. James, go back to the Jets. Jameson Crowder. Like he's basically Terry McLaurin for the Jets. I guess I feel like no. we, I feel like we've doubled no. down on Jamison Crowder so many years in Terry a row McLaurin now. Can, has he's a burner. Jamison Crowder doesn't have that. Speed. Oh, don't, look! I am one of the biggest Terry McLaurin fans. I meant from a volume standpoint, oh. as in Jamison Crowder. Again, like, yeah, I think the biggest issue with Jamison Crowder is we've been spoiled or not spoiled, ruined so many times of not having a full season. Jamis Crowder, if he gets sixteen games, I think right, Jamison he's Crowder. Julian Edelman for the Jets. Is that better? That 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 is better, but I think that ju his volume isn't as safe as we all want to make it out to be. Like last year, who, who was really taking those targets away? Like this year, there's Herndon, there's Perriman, there's Mims, there's Le'Veon Man, Bell in the backfield. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all fair. That's all fair. Um, okay, so now let's finish out as we, we get close to wrapping up this thing uh, with some either ors, right? So let's start with one because we've mentioned these names a couple of times already. If you if you know you have to pick one at whatever their current ADP, well, I shouldn't say their current ADP because this is not going to be fair. But uh, just you think's going to have the better year? How about that? Josh Allen, Cam Newton, where are you going? And I don't need I don't need a long explanation, just a name and maybe a couple words on why you think you know why you think the way you think. And, uh, and can we can, can we just include cost for this one? Just just only this. Sure, one? sure. Call Cam me. Newton because okay. he's, he's still almost basically free right, right sure. now at ADP. Cam Newton. Okay, uh, Devontae Parker or John Brown? I'm going first because I'm taking a few extra words here. I'm sorry, Marcus. Devontae Parker is so ridiculously undervalued. It's it's insane. Like He was only wide receiver two from week four on. And yes, Preston Williams is back. You want to discount him for that. You want to discount him for the running big. Like, discount him as much as you want. That still makes him at least a wide receiver two. Why is he down at wide receiver 28 is beyond me. Yeah, this is an easy one for me too, Devontae Parker. And I think Preston Williams is more of a concern for Mike Gusecki than I do Devontae Parker. All right. Uh, outside the player realm, the Jets logo or the Dolphins logo? Which one you got? The Dolphins, easily. Jets. I like the cleanness of it. The, the, the Dolphin always looked goofy and stupid to me. The teal? <laughs> I love the teal coloring in it. My you, you, my mom feels the same way. She's like, teal, it looks great. She yeah, she also never liked the Raiders jersey. She's like, it's black and gray. And I'm like, no, ma, it's silver and black. Of yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Silver and black. She's like, no, it's just black and gray. I do think it's a little bit overrated. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, <laughs> We're up. Bad taste. All right. RIP your mentions. Um, <laughs> since you guys are both fans of the New York Metropolitans, Jacob deGrom or Noah Syndergaard? This is an easy one. I mean, this is easily Jacob deGrom. No, it's not. You want to know why? Because Syndergaard epitomizes what it's like to be a Mets fan. All this hope for what could be. <laughs> It's just utter <laughs> disappointment year after year after year. That's why it's Cindergard. That oh. is true. That is a good point. But I'll take Jacob DeGrom any day. 
Um, also, as, as Mets fans, do you celebrate like? Do you celebrate Bobby Bonilla Day? Is it sort of like Valentine's Day where people have like singles Independence Day or whatever they call it? Like I celebrate it right now because you say Mets fan. Florio knows this. I'm a disjointed Mets fan. I've banned them six, no, five years, five years ago until the Wilpons are officially gone. I am maybe. Dis- yeah, I, it could be this year. I have distanced myself from the Mets until that happens. So I actually enjoy laughing at Bonilla Day every single year. I think Bobby Bonilla Day is very overrated because <laughs> July 1st is deferment day for everyone. Like Bonilla gets all the hype, but like in a couple of years, the Nationals are going to be paying like Strasburg and Scherzer like $10 million every July 1st. So. And that's still going to end before Bonilla is done. <laughs> <laughs> also, the greatest those, contract ever signed though, Bobby Bonilla. Also, those guys are still playing. You know, Strasburg and Scherzer <laughs> are still actually playing. By so, the way. Um, can we get Bobby Benilla's agent to fix America? Like, that's Man. the genius behind all of this. <laughs> Man, tell me about it. Um, all right, last one. Pulp or no pulp? No pulp. Don't give me stuff to chew in my drink. <laughs> I don't drink orange juice, but I will still go no pulp. All right, which is the reasonable, uh, you know, that is the reasonable. Like, like if I wanted an orange. Tea? I don't want stuff to don't give me stuff to eat when I'm drinking something. If I wanted an orange, I just have an orange. Like that's you. you know, that's that's all I want. Um hey fellas, appreciate you guys jumping in. Um, Jake, for the folks who don't know you, but I feel like if you're listening to this podcast, people know you. But anyway, let folks know where they can find your stuff. Yeah, at All and Kids the easiest because I tweet everything out. But over at the athletic, and if you're not part of it so far, it's still like they still have this 50% off offer. If you scroll down wow. the bottom of the article, it's going away soon. I don't know when, but it's going away <laughs> soon. But yeah, at The Athletic and at Only Kid, that's the easiest way to find everything. All right. And uh, Florio, where can folks find you? You can find me at Michael F. Florio because I'm not the other Mike Florio. <laughs> and uh, my work, uh, soon I'll be back here with you, Marcus, and yeah. I'll be able to get everything at NFL. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, should be exciting. Looking forward to that. Uh, fellas, always appreciate it. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll do this again at some point. Uh, I know, Jake, you, you and I, we chat regularly. I haven't asked you, what uh, is there something on Netflix or, or anything I should be watching? Uh, anything I just watching started anywhere? Dark. Have you watched that yet? I have not it's watched not a that. cartoon. No. Uh, if, you, if you're into, like, the Stranger Things and um, that Fox show, I forget. I can't remember what it Debs? was. It was, like, no, there, it, was, it was one with, uh, like, time travel and stuff like that. Oh, you, uh, actually, Fringe, maybe? Yeah, fringe. If yeah, you like that fringe. kind of stuff, you go go watch Dark. It's in German though, so heads up. <laughs> uh, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I will say I will give you a record right, if if you like you know kind of weird sci fi sort of things. Uh, Homecoming on Amazon Prime. Uh, yeah, well done. And it's you know it's short. Like there's like I think each season is like seven or eight episodes. They're all half an hour. You could literally blow through two seasons in like a day if you want. So did you uh, ever watch Final Space? I haven't watched the second season of Final Space. I know. I need to go watch it. I know. My bad. I'm sorry. I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do that. When I'm up like, you know, I, I'm up late. So I'll go find Final Space and I'll watch the second season. So, All right. There it is. That is it. We are done. We appreciate you listening and downloading and watching our clips as well. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, always borrow money from a pessimist. You won't expect it back. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you on Thursday.